Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the text finding session. Uh, our first prelegant will be Maciej Hrabonsz. He will talk about classification of patent applications. The floor is yours. Hi. <laughs> so, as it was said, I will talk about classification of the patent application. Uh, our team uh, participated in a GovTech uh, competition, which goal was to predict the class of the patent given the patent application. And as you can see, uh, there are the, the classes are structured as a tree, but I'm going to talk about it uh, in, a, in a second. I'd like firstly to introduce you into this idea. Uh, what was the problem about? So let's start with the data. We were given long documents, PDFs, which were few A4 pages long. The language used in this Python application was really specialized because it's scientific language, which is really far from the language which we use daily. So there are current a lot of very rare words and the documents were also structured. Uh, they had two parts. First, general, which was an introduction to the idea, talking really shallowly about the idea behind the patent. And the second part, describing really precisely what the patent is about. Now, what about the task? So our task was a multi-label classification because the patent can, of course, belong to many classes. There were huge amounts of classes, tens of thousands. And a big problem, another big problem was that it was really imbalanced data set. Some classes occurred even only once and others occurred a few times, whereas others occurred thousands of times in the data set. And as it was shown at the beginning, the classes are hierarchical. Uh, there are three structure, and some branches uh, are have had a depth of 11. And to each class, uh, there was given a description, which could be uh, potentially useful information. And I'm going to show you how we try to use it after. So what about the state of the art for document classification? So for Currently, there are complex deep learning models, mostly transformers like BERT or something, some other kind of uh, transformer. And they are based on embeddings. They treat documents as a sequence and they perform well for short and medium lens documents. And the problem is that our documents were thousands or, or a few thousands of uh, words had. And uh, we didn't. Uh, we were unable to use this pre-trained model because the text were just too long and we would lose some information while using uh, this pre-trained model. So what what did we try? To, what was what were the, our ideas? So firstly, we tried something really simple. So we created TFEDF and we used it as a tree model. So how this idea worked? We created term frequency inverse document frequency for all the documents that we had. And then we just trained on uh, this representation, our tree-based model. Uh, even though the model was really fast, the problem was that it didn't find any meaningful uh, relations between this representation and the class of the patent. Uh, it uh, classified documents really purely, poorly. It had accuracy about one or 2%. So we really quickly try to find another way to uh, tackle this problem. So then we uh, used Doc2Vec to create representation for each class. So, uh, you can see on the bottom the architecture. So Doc2Vec is like Word2Vec, but we are creating representation for each document. But in our uh, example, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, create representation for each document but for each class. So instead of having a paragraph ID, which is a document ID, we just were giving uh, which class uh, this document belongs to. And uh, after uh, uh, training this model, when given new document, we were inferring vector representation for this new document, and we were finding uh, the closest class uh, or paragraph ID in, a, uh, in this, uh, plot, and that's how we classified uh, the documents. But Dr. Vex showed really promising results, but far the methods are really better. Uh, another idea was n words. So how it works? Because we have really many classes, we create 
n words with random, randomly sam sampled bean subclasses. Then we train n models for each word, and these models classify to which bin document should belong. And after uh, having a document, we aggregate all the predictions from these n models, and we select classes which were most common in those predicted bins. Uh, we tried many representations uh, for this idea, but uh, our, our uh, representation, which is called embedding cloud, was superior to others, which I'm going to talk about really shortly. And another idea was using class description. So we got keywords from, for each class from its description. And then we just tried to find these keywords and we classify the comment uh, as a class which uh, had uh, most keywords uh, documents. This is how humans categorize uh, patent applications. We tried. Uh, we would try to extract more information, like including synonyms, uh, weighting some words, and various similarity metrics. But it all fell uh, really short, uh, short to our um, our final idea. And what was our final solution? So it's embedding class. That's how we called it. So uh, if we plot uh, embedding words embedding on uh, on the 2D plane, we can, in this example, see that documents with the same class, the blue and red documents, are from the same class, and they their distribution of word embeddings is different from a uh, distribution of third green document, which is from class two. But how to represent the distribution? So in two dimensions, we just create 2D beans and we just count how many times the uh, word falls into, how many words are in a specific bin. But uh, there is a really big problem if you think about it, because word embeddings are, which we used were 300 dimensional. So if you use 10 bins per coordinate, uh, and we have dimensionality of 300, then we will be left with a vector of length 10 to the power of 300. So oh, it's something that even supercomputers would have the trouble to uh, learn something from that. So what was our solution to that? Instead of using uh, multidimensional distribution, we just uh, simplified the problem and used marginal distributions for each of the dimensions. So uh, we took 10 bins per coordinate and using this marginal uh, distribution for uh, this dimension, we just uh, created bins and counted how many times uh, word fell in that. And that was our uh, final uh, uh, final representation, which was then fed into our model. But what are the features on of embedding clouds? So it's a reasonable representation for long documents, because uh, if we have many words, uh, we can the distribution uh, really shows, and uh, the statistics are more sure. Uh, and it's reasonable representation for documents with uh, rare words or some specialized words, because embeddings uh, uh, of words which are similar should should fall in the same place or should be similar. And this representation is constant length vector. So we don't have to worry about how long our document is. We always end up with the same uh, vector representation, which has the same length. And our model was a simple one layer uh, perceptron, uh, which we trained for a multi-label classification using cross entropy. And we did not take into cons consideration structure of the document, which I talked at the beginning. We did not uh, tell the model that this text is from the small, more uh, shallow part, and the other is from the part which uh, is uh, more advanced or more deeply into the idea. And we optimized the number of bins. We found out that 30 bins uh, dimension is best, so our feature vector was 9,000 dimensional. Uh, we also, of course, uh, optimized the structure of the network because it was uh, a one layer perceptron. We just had to optimize uh, one hyperparameter, which will, and 
we just use the hidden layer of 2000 neurons. And we also removed uh, categories which had less than four example, and it reduced number of labels from 90,000 to 40,000. And uh, we used that because it was a competition and we thought that if we want to have the best score, we have to get rid of these examples which will only destroy our model because if they are so uh, rare in the training data set, uh, we have to look at the classes which are more common. And we also only used data from last 30 years. We tested uh, more or less years, but uh, our models showed us that the best presentation were from maximum 30 years past. And it's really reasonable if you think about it because the documents which are really old, uh, not only they have different language, but also they are about different ideas because now they are different uh, patent applications which are, uh, if there are, for example, 50 years uh, ago, there, were, there weren't any patent application about AI or something like that. So we just uh, thought, uh, thought that that's a good idea to uh, not use all the data. And what were our results? So on the first stage, uh, the evaluation was that we present, we proposed uh, uh, five categories on fourth level. And if at least one is valid for this document, you get one point. And we got uh, 56 points uh, from uh, 100 testing documents. And we had second place. And on the second stage of the competition, the evaluation was more complex. And each, uh, to each document, we again proposed five categories. Uh, and we, we had to uh, consider all levels of categories. So in, we uh, had to propose from 90,000 classes. And from these five, they selected three best uh, classes, which were best matched. And you got one point for guessing correct category at each level, which was lower than third level. So you could get one point for fourth or fifth and so on and so on. And our score was again, was 39% uh, from uh, 200 testing documents. And we unfortunately another time took a second place, but we are still on the podium. So we were quite happy about uh, our results. That's all I wanted to talk about uh, today. And I'm really uh, hoping that you will ask some questions on the Slack and I will gladly answer them if you have any. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Maciej, for your presentation. Uh, for now, we don't have any questions, but like Maciej said, you can ask questions later uh, on our Slack. So the next presentation will be about parsing user agent strings in models by Sergey Masticki. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much, guys, for joining the session. So my name is Sergey Masticki. Uh, I work as a data science lead uh, at Aviva, the largest insurance company in the UK. And today I'm going to talk about something called user agent strings and how one can use them in um, machine learning applications. So to begin with, let's uh, define what the user agent string actually is. Um, so imagine you are trying to um, reach a website on the internet. And of course, for that, you would be using a browser. And um, uh, browser is a piece of software in this context is called user agent. So this is a piece of software that represents you or acts uh, on behalf of you as a user. When browser talks to a server, it uh, does it through so-called HTTP requests. And HTTP requests, such as a GET request, a POST request, for example, um, has something called uh, um, uh, request headers. And uh, user agent strings is, some of, uh, is one of those uh, uh, request headers. What it does, actually, it uh, describes what, uh, uh, what kind of browser actually is trying to talk to, to the server. So it describes that software that is acting on, on user's behalf. 
And the original purpose of user agent streams was uh, something called content negotiation. So basically what it means is that depending on um, what the browser tells about itself to the server, the server would know what kind of content and in what form to serve back to the, to the browser. Now let's have a look at uh, how a typical user agent stream looks like. This is one example. Uh, so as you can see, it's a, it's a, a string of text uh, that uh, actually, if you look closer, contains many useful data points, such as, for example, uh, the device that the user is on, the, the uh, type of uh, operational system um, that that device is running under, the, the version of this of that uh, operational system, uh, the platform uh, that was used to develop the browser, and some other details about the about the browser itself. So, in other words, a bunch of useful uh, data points. Um, because of this, uh, user agent streams actually found many other use cases, not only uh, the, the original purpose of uh, content negotiation. So user agent streams these days are heavily used in, uh, for example, web analytics, that is reporting on the traffic composition that then can be used to optimize uh, the effectiveness of a website, for example. Uh, they are also uh, heavily used in traffic management, uh, meaning uh, things like, uh, for example, blocking nuisance bots and crawlers, uh, uh, preventing click fraud, which is a huge problem in the advertising uh, industry and so on. But also interestingly, one can use user agent strings and the information that they contain uh, in uh, predictive models. And uh, my talk essentially is about this use case right here on the right. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, why uh, user agent strings are so useful uh, in terms of uh, machine learning applications? Well, that's because the information they contain can encode actually many useful uh, user or customer characteristics. For example, based on the device a, a user is, uh, is on, we can uh, infer uh, you know, or at least uh, get proxies for, for the lifestyle and tech savviness of that user. Yeah, for example, if someone is predominantly <clears throat> using a desktop, desktop computer, that's one case. But if someone is uh, on the phone all the time, that's a different uh, lifestyle. If, for example, someone's uh, operational system is out of date quite significantly, that probably suggests that that person is not really tech savvy. Yeah, they're not updating the, uh, the device too often. Um, also, we can in, uh, influence or at least get a proxy of the affluence of that person. Again, if someone, for example, is uh, uh, using a, an iPhone, um, that's a different story from a, a, another person who is using, for example, a cheaper phone. So that tells you uh, something about the affluence of, of those uh, users. And also, uh, in some applications, it can be uh, very important to uh, separate the human from non-human human traffic. So these are just one example as to why user agent strings can be useful in machine learning applications. Now, uh, how exactly do we use uh, that information contained in user agent strings in machine learning applications? Well, uh, a typical approach would be to extract the uh, relevant pieces from, from that uh, uh, text string and then uh, encode or one hot encode uh, those uh, pieces uh, as features in our uh, model. However, there is a problem with that approach, unfortunately. So first of all, uh, user agent strings do not have a consistent format. And uh, also because um, uh, new devices uh, constantly emerge, new operational systems constantly emerge, new versions of, uh, of those devices and operational uh, systems emerge, uh, that all results in uh, astronomical numbers of all, all the possible combinations that one can encounter in user agent strings. And as a result, if you were to use uh, uh, um, a user agent uh, parser, uh, uh, it would become very quickly very uh, difficult to, to maintain such a parser because usually such parsers, which are many actually out there, they typically uh, uh, are based on um, regular expressions. So that means that the uh, maintainer of that parser uh, would have to constantly track what's happening in the world of user agent streams to keep that parser relevant. And even if we were able to use uh, uh, a well-working uh, parser, we would end up with a bunch, a bunch of uh, features that would make our uh, uh, data matrix uh, um, 
extremely large and extremely sparse, which is going to be a problem for most of the machine learning um, algorithms uh, today. So what is the solution for that? Well, uh, what we can do is to uh, try to uh, embed user agent strings into a low dimensional space. In other words, generate uh, a vector representation of each and single uh, user agent string that we want to pass into a model. Uh, these days, it can be done in a variety of ways, of course, as, as most of you know, but uh, one particular algorithm I found to be working uh, uh, extremely well is the famous fast text from uh, Facebook. I'm not going to talk about the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the mechanisms uh, behind this, this algorithm and how it works, but just to highlight a few important uh, points. Uh, this algorithm is not data hungry. So what that means in practical terms is that we uh, uh, just need a few thousands of uh, examples to train a decently performing model. Uh, this algorithm works uh, quite well on short and well-structured documents, which user uh, agent strings are in many cases. As the name suggests, this algorithm is also very fast to train. And also importantly, the so-called out of vocabulary words are not a big problem uh, for, for fast text. So all in all, uh, uh, it makes fast text a, a good, at least first method to try when it comes to, to, to embedding user agent strings into a low dimensional space. Uh, now, how can we use uh, um, this algorithm in R? Well, it's actually quite easy to do. Uh, there are already quite a few wrappers uh, around uh, for R uh, that one can use, uh, uh, wrappers around the official C++ library. But what we can also do is uh, use the official FastText Python library, which we can call uh, from within R thanks to the famous reticulate package. Uh, here on the slide, you see an example as to how that potentially might look like. Um, so obviously, first, one would have to install Python and uh, the FastText module on their machine, and the instructions can be found online. Then we would call the reticulate package. Uh, um, uh, then it would be a good idea to check whether the, the FastText module actually is available to R. And if, it, if this is the case, then we can easily call the uh, or load the FastText library uh, using the following com command. And then once, we, once we, we've done all of that, um, we can use the uh, dollar notation uh, on that FT object, as in this example, to uh, call the required methods. So super easy. What I'm going to do next is to uh, um, show you guys a couple of examples as to how one can um, use fast text uh, to, to train unsupervised and supervised transformers um, uh, for the task at hand. So the first case, unsupervised uh, transformers, uh, um, they would be particularly useful if uh, one wants to build, uh, let's say, a, a generic library of user agent string uh, vector representations. So in this case, we do not obviously have any, any labeled data, but due to the, fast, uh, due to the way fast text works, we can actually uh, 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 still generate such embeddings. Another case would be supervised embeddings. Uh, obviously, uh, by definition, in that case, one would have to, to have uh, labeled data. And um, that labels uh, ideally would be specific for the task at hand, whatever the task is. And uh, obviously, uh, sometimes it can be quite difficult to, to generate labeled data. But luckily, uh, this is where those existing parsers can be of, of, uh, of, of help. Uh, now. Uh, what I'm going to do next is to use this uh, sample of 200,000 um, uh, unique user agent strings that uh, I've extracted from the whatismybrother.com database to show you how that might work uh, in R. Uh, the data uh, looks uh, uh, very simple in, in terms of the format. So it's just a, a text file where each line corresponds to the uh, user agent string. Now, here on, on this slide, you see an example as to how one could uh, train an unsupervised model. Uh, again, the command is super simple. All we do is we call the, the respective method, train unsupervised. We provide our uh, input data, the text file we, we, with our user agent strings. And we define a bunch of parameters uh, that, def, uh, that, that control how the, the, the model training would, would, would go. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these parameters. Uh, uh, the most interesting bit here probably is the dimensionality of that vector that we want to have in the end. 
And in this example, I chose uh, a vector of size 32. Um, once we trained our model, uh, we can then uh, pass new documents or new user agent strings through that model or through that transformer to generate the, uh, the, the feature vectors. Uh, this slide again shows you one example as to how that might be done. Uh, the slide looks a bit busy, but uh, what's important here is this line essentially. So what we do here is we uh, call the um, get sentence vector uh, uh, in that uh, trained model. And what that command does is uh, it returns uh, an average vector for a given user agent stream. And here at the bottom of the slide, you have an example uh, uh, of how the, the result and feature vectors look like. So what we have here is the first 10 elements of each vector uh, for the first uh, three uh, documents from, from a, a test data set. So super simple. And this is uh, the way how these features would eventually uh, enter uh, machine learning models if, if you wanted to use something like that. Now, uh, of course, uh, um, an important question would be, uh, how good are these uh, uh, embeddings that we just generated? Yeah, The best way uh, to, to check that, of course, would be to actually include them into a model and see whether they uh, are of any, perform uh, of any importance in terms of the performance of that model at all. But before one does that, uh, um, what we can also do is um, uh, try to visualize the, the, the uh, um, the, the solution we uh, just obtained, right? Uh, to do that, uh, what we could uh, do is use um, the, the famous Disney algorithm. And in this case, you, what you see is the uh, uh, Disney visualization of the uh, embeddings we just uh, obtained in the previous slide. And what I've done here is I color coded these dots um, according to the type of hardware, in particular computer, mobile, and server. And what we immediately see from this graph is uh, that the embeddings we obtained actually are quite useful. Uh, and we can say that because as you can see, the, the dots in this, in this diagram uh, actually are separated quite nicely in terms of, of that uh, types of, of the hardware. Yeah, we see a big cloud of, of, uh, of uh, user agent strings that represent uh, mobile devices, the, the blue dots. Um, we see the uh, computers here uh, represented as red dots, and we see the, the, the servers uh, represented as green dots. Interestingly, we have a couple of uh, quite separated green clouds here, which probably correspond to, say, Linux and, Winux, uh, and Windows uh, servers. Uh, that would need to be uh, uh, <laughs> uh, understood better by looking at the exact user, uh, user agent strings here. Um, now, so this is an example of a, 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 an unsupervised solution. But uh, as I said, we can also train a supervised uh, transformer as well. For that, we need to add labels to data. And it's, uh, again, super easy to do. Uh, what you see here on the slide is an example of how uh, fast text expects data uh, to be. And all we have to do is to prepend each line uh, in our text uh, 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 file uh, with a label, which starts with this prefix, uh, double underscore label, double underscore, and then the actual label goes. So super easy. Um, to train uh, a supervised model, we would, we would, we would choose uh, uh, the, the train supervised method. And again, the command would be super uh, similar to what we've seen already before. In terms of visualizing this solution, this is how it looks like. As you can see, it's much, much cleaner compared to what we obtained uh, before uh, with an unsupervised solution. The, the clouds are really separated well here. And uh, just to, uh, to summarize what I tried to, to, to present here today. So the information contained in user agent strings can be efficiently represented using low dimensional embeddings. Uh, whenever possible, I would recommend to uh, uh, use task specific embeddings and in terms of the algorithms to generate such vector representations, do give a try to fast text. Uh, if you want to uh, repeat uh, the uh, examples I just showed here in my presentation, you can uh, check them at my GitHub page. And also, if you're interested, do get in touch uh, with me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergey. That was a perfect presentation. So our next speaker will be Michael Voss. 
and he will talk about text mining techniques on Polish national news. The floor is yours. Yeah, let me uh, share my screen. Hi, everyone. For now, we cannot see your screen. Yeah, my group. Give me one second. Now you should okay. see my screen. Everything is okay. Okay, let me. Okay, so hi, my name is Michel Foss. I'm a fifth year uh, student at the Poznan University of uh, Economics and Business. And today I will present you a topic uh, about the text mining me me methods on Polish national uh, news. So you probably ask me, yeah, why this topic? Yeah, And uh, let's give me some background. Uh, on May 2015, there was a presidential election in Poland. And there was a surprise victory of uh, Andrzej Duda. Since then, uh, the, uh, the, the, the political party, which he belongs to, won also the parliamentary elections in October 2015. And a lot of people are talking about uh, the current state of, let's say, democracy in Poland. And as you can see in the Polish Freedom House Index, which conducts uh, research and advocacy on democracy, political freedom and human rights. As you can see, since the political uh, turnover, there is a decrease. It's, it's still not a, a, such a massive uh, decrease uh, like Hungary. But I think it's only a matter of time where we will be the, the same level than at uh, like Hungary. But when it also comes to a press freedom index, it's also uh, worth to mention that there is an organization which is called uh, Press Freedom. They are creating an annual report to, to show the, the freedom of journalists. And as you can see, it's in Polish, sorry, but I couldn't find the, the English version. But since the, the 2015, it's been decreasing. And now 2020, we're at the 62nd place between Armenia and Seychelles. Yeah, not the best spot for a European country, let's say. Okay, so what I wanted to basically show you is the, are the headlines of some articles about Poland. And as a Polish citizen, I don't want to see my country as a, you know, as a far right, uh, place for some activists. I want to be my country as as good as possible. I would like to to yeah, Europe see us as a, a modern country and then not as a you know country of the uh, Eastern Bloc. But yeah, those are unfortunately some headlines which I found, and uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. So my goal of of this analysis was basically to analyze Polish national news on a daily basis. And I wanted to compare those news with some other news uh, providers in Poland, which are not public, which is, for example, Fakty from TVN and Polsat News. And yeah, I, I just wanted to basically uh, have an impact or a control, uh, also the influence of the government, if they like, you know, have some impact on the news. So yeah, I thought, okay, I have the topic. Yeah, let's think how to gather the data. I thought first about using the VOD platform from TVP. They have a VOD platform where you can uh, watch the news on a daily basis. But I had some problems related to data gathering. Yeah? I had to somehow extract the, the, the whole information from the news. So I downloaded an episode and uh, wanted to extract the subtitles but it came out that there are no subtitles on the VOD platform. So my second approach was to use my uh, default beta receiver. But uh, yeah, I have an old one and yeah, I could record some uh, news, but I had to do it by my hand. So basically for a few days, I was at my home. I had to click on, the, uh, on my pilot to record uh, news. Then I was... Uh, with my pen drive uh, extracting the data to my laptop and then yeah, trying to get anything, which was also not yeah, the best solution. So my uh, end solution was based on Raspberry Pi. So let's talk about the latest technical setup. I decided to uh, use my Raspberry Pi for gigabytes of RAM with a 32 micro SD card. 
And I also had to use a TV, a TV head tuner, the default beta, because I need to, uh, and that I, I had to extract the satellite images, which is not possible with the standard Raspberry Pi. And I also had to use a package called TV headend to basically have any option to, to record uh, the news and yeah, download the data. Let me show you how the, the last package looks. It looks basically, it's uh, when you open it, it's a local host site where you can uh, watch the TV. If you would like switch on the, click on this icon here, you, would, you could see the, the uh, television on your laptop without having you know, any receiver, which is good. But I used the digital video recorder setup here and I could set up some recordings. So I uh, set up a, a regex for the national TV news and it was uh, recorded every day at the same hour for a half hour. Yeah, but I had the, the TSV files because this is the format which, is, uh, which are the PVR uh, receivers recording. Okay, but what, what should I do with the video files? So as you probably know, some of the uh, news or uh, programs allow us to uh, show the sub subtitles. And I knew that uh, the Polish national TV news, they had some uh, subtitles embedded in the video. So I used the CC extractor, uh, which is a tool to analyze video files and uh, produce subtitles from the uh, videos. And as, as you can see, it's uh, supported in mo most of the areas in, in the world, also in, uh, for example, America, but it does not support Chinese television. So basically, I only had to write this comment in my comment line to extract all the subtitles from all my data, yeah, which is a pretty uh, nice way. And if you ask uh, this argument, uh, the T page uh, means basically uh, the teletext page, 777. It's uh, the main, the, it's the default page where the subtitles are located in Poland. Okay, so I had the data, but I had to, yeah, somehow extract, analyze the data. So I used uh, some stop words from uh, the repo, I, I, you see. I used some uh, stemming uh, dictionary from uh, Marcin Kosinski, one of the organizers. Thanks, Marcin. I used also the subtools. It's a package in R, which uh, extracts uh, the subtitles from the SRT file and inserts into a data frame in R. I also use the, the standard, let's say, packages for uh, text mining in R. But what's interesting, I also use the LDA tuning to find the optimal number of topics for LDA. Okay, so I had the, the, the data. So what I wanted to do is extract as, as many information as I could from the data. So for example, what I did, uh, what I, did I entered the uh, TV national news uh, provider site check the numbers of the uh, anchormans and search for the ones uh, by every day. So as you can see, uh, then I yeah, created the infographic to show you uh, what anchormans uh, were the yeah, speakers of the program by every day. And this is just extracted by the text. The, the graphic uh, was done later. Of course, I had uh, the text by every day the word set by every person in the news. So I plotted, as you can see, the number of words in the national news per day. As you can see, I have some uh, free spots by a few days. Unfortunately, I had uh, some problems with my Raspberry Pi. Uh, the setup was not of optimal. I had uh, the 32 gigabytes of space, but those files were pretty heavy. And sometimes, uh, yeah, the Raspberry Pi Pi was just uh, stuck, unfortunately. So unfortunately, I had some missing points. But let's check the most popular words across the news. And as you can probably think, uh, yeah, uh, those were some uh, news in Poland. So the word uh, Polish, Poland will have the most uh, occurrences. But what's interesting, uh, there are also a lot of occurrences of the word animal and president. Of course, also Belarus, because yeah, there is a conflict uh, by, at our neighbor. 
and uh, Warsaw, our uh, yeah, city, the biggest city in Poland. Okay, also uh, conducted a, a word cloud based on the words uh, used in the world in the national news. As you can see, Polish, Poland are la, la, the most popular, but also you can see at the top coronavirus. Yeah, the, let's say it's the main topic in all the news uh, the world in the late uh, in the yeah, latest uh, months. So no wonder there there is any point of it. I also conducted an uh, interesting chart uh, where you can see the most popular uh, five terms by day. And, uh, what I find interesting is, of course, by every day, it's almost yeah, Poland, the most popular word. But there are, for example, some days like the 31st August, where there is Solidarność. If you're not from Poland, you will not know what does it mean, but it's basically a trade union founded on the 31st August uh, 1980. So th this was some, the, it was the 70th, it was the uh, 40th uh, anniversary. So basically the whole uh, news was um, based on the anniversary. But also, if you uh, look at the next day, it's Westerplatte and it's, uh, it's a place where uh, one of the first battles were uh, done between Poland and Germany in the Second World War. So as you can see, it's, uh, it's uh, nicely visible that uh, on a daily basis, there are some topics which are yeah every day. But sometimes if there is any uh, anniversary, uh, yeah, a, a word could uh, be the most popular. Of course, it's also visible at the end of the chart where you can see, for example, Zwierzę, which means animal. Uh, we've been uh, discussing a lot the latest le legislation in Poland about uh, animal uh, fears. And yeah, this, this term was uh, how, um, yeah, widely used. Of course, I, I wanted to check uh, the number of occurrences of some words. So you, here you can see some plot about uh, Belarus, coronavirus and uh, Germany. And yeah, what's interesting, uh, as you can see, coronavirus is like every day mentioned in the news because we have a lot of re uh, records broken every day. But also Belarus is sometimes a pretty common topic. Let's say, let's check the, some contro controversial topics like LGTB rights and uh, some judge and some legislation. Uh, the legislation topic came with the animal for uh, activists, let's say. And as you can see there, uh, yeah, it's been hardly and wi widely used in the national news uh, within over a week. Uh, I thought, okay, let's check then the most popular politicians in Poland. And yeah, Duda is our president. Kaczynski is the... Uh, uh, yeah, the CEO, let's say, of the uh, National Party, the Law and Justice. Morawiecki is like our Prime Minister and Trzaskowski is like the, uh, the head of the opposition. So what's interesting, on one day, on the 5th of September, uh, the head of the opposition was mentioned over 20 times in the national news. Yeah, pretty a lot of times, and it's not always uh, in a positive aspect, as you can uh, probably think of. I also thought about, okay, let's check the, the most popular politicians across uh, Europe and the world. So I thought about uh, Lukashenko, uh, Merkel, Putin, and Trump. What's interesting, you will see Trump at the end of August mentioned over 20 times, then decreasing, and then again, uh, yeah, increasing because uh, there was a lot of, uh, yeah, topics uh, related with the vaccine of coronavirus. So if you mention the vaccine, you also mention US and you also mention Trump. But you see a, a nice correlation uh, at the yeah, middle of September, uh, September between uh, Lukashenko uh, and uh, Putin, which, is, uh, which also somehow co corresponds because those are, those are neighbors and they were talking a lot of, uh, about those uh, yeah, problems in the country. I thought about also plotting the political parties in the country. And as you can see, uh, yeah, 
the the two biggest um, parties like platforma and peace are um, mostly mentioned in the news and the other kind of parties are um, almost never mentioned in the news also conducted an lda analysis uh, with the package I, I talked before with the LDA tuning, I found the optimal number of topics, which is 19. I think it was a pretty good number of topics because I had 21 days of data. Of course, not every day we have the same topics, but at some point, uh, yeah, it had, it had the best value for the metrics. So I, I thought, uh, let's use it. And uh, unfortunately, in every uh, topic, uh, you will see the, the, the word uh, Poland or Polish. But there are some interesting topics like uh, the second, which uh, you can see Navalny. Yeah, there was the, the thing with the poison. And you will see the, the say poison, yeah, on the third, uh, on, on the fourth position, which corresponds to the whole situation. Interesting is also the 15th topic. Uh, Western Platte, Poland, Polish, uh, Germany, uh, German. Yeah, the, the Second World uh, War was, uh, yeah, has started in Poland, between Poland and Germany. So it's obvious that those countries have to be mentioned. Also, the 19th topic is interesting. It's Solidarność. So uh, as I said, the anniversary. So there was a lot of about uh, yeah, Poland and uh, the political situation. There are also topics related with COVID uh, and about the vaccine. Yeah, Lessons learned about uh, how to gather the data and analyze. A solid infrastructure is everything. Uh, as you probably saw in the, at the beginning, I wanted to use free sources, but unfortunately I couldn't extract the subtitles from uh, the two other providers from the news. I could only from the national news provided. So yeah, you have to think about a solid infrastructure. And for example, if uh, your uh, virtual machine runs out of memory, uh, you should somehow uh, tackle the problem by uh, a script, not manually delete the, the files because you will not record some files. Try to automate as much as you can. Uh, yeah, at the beginning, I wanted to record those uh, let's say news by hand, which uh, yeah, corresponds to losing a lot of time, private time, and it was not a good solution. So we yeah, tried to optimize and ask as much questions as possible about your infrastructure and the whole setup, if it does make sense, uh, because I wanted to uh, yeah, use a speech to text algorithm. I don't think it would be an approach that uh, is efficient in this case. So I just wanted to have the data and not to overkill and over engineer it. Yeah, thanks to your attending and thanks to my Lukasz Prokurski and his blog, because based on his knowledge, I, I had uh, some source to yeah use and learn. And yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, so, just as a reminder uh, for everyone who is watching, you can ask the question on our YouTube chat and also on our Slack. So, the last presentation for today will be from Eric Walczak, and he will talk about using care to study banking regulations. The floor is yours. Eric, we cannot hear you. You are muted. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Walczak, and I'm a data scientist at the Bank of England. So, could you also start... turn up your microphone? Okay, I'll just get a bit closer. Um, Thanks. So, let, let me start with a very brief disclaimer. So, the views in these presentations are, are mine and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bank of England or, or its committees. So, uh, this project was conducted with several collaborators. Um, Zahid, uh, James, Nick, Rajan, and myself. And what I like about this particular project is that it combines data science knowledge and deep technical expertise of, uh, of banking. So for those who, who don't know, uh, the Bank of England is, is the central bank of the United Kingdom. And 
the bank, among other things, supervises and regulates banks. So that's that's one of the reasons why, why we are interested interested in this particular topic. So um, the we decided to study regulation because there are several costs of regulation, really. Opportunity costs, compliance costs, and cognitive costs. In this particular study, we focus on cognitive costs. So costs which are re related to understanding um, understanding text, uh, reading rules, for example. Um, and, and the cognitive costs are related to complexity. So we wanted to measure complexity of of rules, of, of regulation, of, of law. So, so this topic should be relevant to anyone who is interested in supervisory technology, regulatory technology, or legal technology. Um, so why should we do this textual analysis of rules? So, um, well, rules are embedded in text and data on, on regulatory costs are scarce. So you can't necessarily say how much does uh, does it cost to implement uh, regulation? It's quite hard to obtain this kind of data, but texts are readily available, and we can use natural language processing to analyze large amounts of texts. And we use different types of measures, measures of cognitive costs of processing texts, which were grounded in psycholinguistics, for example, and computational linguistics. So how many concepts uh, actually you need to understand to to uh, to process text, uh, and also how, how much time it actually um, is required to, um, to understand different texts and, and, uh, and also different concepts that are embedded in, included in text. <clears throat> so in the past, people would normally measure complexity of texts uh, or regulation just by measuring the length, which is something we did here as well. That was the first thing that, that we started with. So we wanted to compare how banking regulations, UK banking regulations changed between 2007 and 2017. So how, how the regulations looked before the crisis, the great financial crisis and after the crisis. Um, there were quite a few changes to, to the regulations in that time. And we wanted to quantify these changes. So we started with measuring the volume of, um, of rules and guidance. So um, we, we observed that the, there was a large increase in, in the length of regulation, so from 400,000 words to 700,000 words. But we also, um, we also were able to, to see how this volume is split between different sources. So uh, in, in banking regulations, we have different, um, different sources of rules. So some of them come from, from EU, some come from um, capital requirement regulation, other from technical standards, uh, some from supervisory statements, and, and we were able to actually to, to measure this, um, this complexity or the source of complexity. But as I mentioned, just measuring, just looking at the length is, is a relatively basic way of, of measuring complexity, so we wanted to do something, uh, something more than that. So now I'm going to talk you through um, details really so uh, i'll start with talking about data so how we acquire this data and i'll mention uh, i'll talk a bit more about r so not just the domain not just uh, uh, banking regulation but, but uh, given that it's an r conference i should also talk about how these things were, were done um, so we wanted to capture a data set that would be comprehensive for post-crisis and um, also um, for before crisis as well uh, we wanted to make this data set comparable before and after the crisis, and we wanted to facilitate network analysis. So we we did this in, in the following way. So uh, as I mentioned previously, the different sources of, of banking regulation. So we started with scraping uh, the websites. So uh, among other websites, there is a, there is a Prudential Regulation Authority um, rulebook which is very nicely structured. So we were able to extract tabular data, um, but we also have to extract the data from um, a lot of PDF documents. So that required um, a bit more um, intervention. So we had to use regular expression, PDF tools to, to extract the data and, um, and to put all this in a tabular format. Most of this information was all automated, but we also, requires help from, from research assistants to actually to double check that our information is is correct. 
and the code to acquire data, this is from, from the Prudential Regulation Authority rulebook, is available on, on GitHub. So I wrote a package that um, that essentially extracts data from, from the website and puts it into nice tabular form. So for anyone who is interested in text or network analysis, you can go to the to the URL and download the package and, and use it for, for your own for your own purposes. We also acquired uh, extracted links from, from the regulation. So on the right hand side you can see you can see an example of, of a regulation. So here you can see this rule 1.1 application provision which mentions another rule, rule 4.2. So so you can think about this as two elements of, of network. So rule 1.1 is one is one node and it's connected to another node rule 4.2. And connection between them is is what's called an edge in, in network science. So, so that's how we also generated this um, data set uh, for, for network analysis. So um, now I'm going to move about move to talking about measures. So we used several measures coming from um, inspired by different different um, areas. So we started with linguistic measures. So um, lexical diversity, conditionality, um, length, um, and uh, these measures can be calculated as uh, well relative frequency of, of different uh, terms, for example, for the first one. Uh, so that tells you about how many concepts there are included in, in regulation. Conditionality tells you about um, relative frequency of, of conditional statements, things like if or but, which, uh, which um, make, can make regulation more or less complicated. And uh, the, the last one was, was length, so just number of words for, for the standard measure. So here we use uh, custom functions, which we wrote ourselves, and also some, some tokenizers. Uh, we also use Quantita, which is a great package for, for working with text. Um, we also acquired several measures um, from network science. So here, we had a degree, which is probably the, the most common um, measure, which is a number of direct cross references to a rule. Um, but we also have degree um, from a rule. We also had this page rank, which is a which is a Google's algorithm, famous algorithm, um, which tells you about the chain of cross references leading to a rule. So centrality, it tells you about centrality of a, of a particular. I'm sorry, rule. Eric. Could you refresh your screen because we are, I think we've got some technical problems again and we are still seeing only the first slide. Okay. okay yeah, yeah okay. now it's working. Yeah. Thanks. So, so here you can see, you can see the, the, uh, the measures I was mentioning. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll just go briefly uh, show you this, uh, this slide. I think that, that's the Q1 here that, that was, uh, that's, that tells you about the change in the volume of regulations. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. Um, and here you can see um, data sets. So that's, that's where, when, when I mentioned how data set was required and also you have, it, you have the URL um, with the package that, uh, that allows you to pull this data. Okay, so I'll, I'll move um, forward. So um, another, inspiration for, for our measures was uh, was, uh, was law uh, or, or legal research. So we also acquired measures of vagueness, which is a ratio of vague terms, things like reasonable or adequate, which tell you about cognitive costs. So, so um, need for interpretation. So, uh, so whether you can understand this rule a certain way or whether it requires certain discretion. Uh, and also we measure we measure precision. So here that's the ratio of very precise numerical signs, words things like um, GBP or percentage, which uh, which tells you about um, thresholds or, or, or really uh, well defined um, concepts. Okay. So once we have these measures, they have to be verified because uh, well we could we could measure things, but we also need to understand how. Um, how reliable these things are. So in, in order to do that, we um, we used 
Q&A for questions which were submitted to European Banking Authority. And here you can see an example of this, of this Q&A. So, so different organizations can um, post questions on the banking, um, European Banking Authority website. And um, we, we use the fact that people ask, uh, organizations ask questions about different rules as a way to, to verify if, if our complexity measure can predict the fact that a question will be asked, which, which would be then a proxy of, of complexity. So, um, so we, we fitted this model, um, a rich logistic regression model, um, which you can see here specified. So on the left hand side, uh, essentially you have this dummy uh, which which told you whether um, whether a rule had a question uh, or answer attached to it, and on the right hand side you had a, a vector of complexity measure for a particular rule, and we also use a dummy for for a topic to to control for for non-cognitive costs. And uh, using this model, we were able to 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 verify that that our measures um, indeed. Uh, can, can predict this complexity, so we validated to a certain extent our, our metrics, and we found that centrality was the most uh, the, the best predictor, really. So, so um, inward degree and page rank, as you can see here in, in yellow, uh, it shows you central rule that tells you um, that was the most uh, most predictive, really, of question being asked. So it, it tells you that that Q and A's focus on rules which are central, long, precise, and contain multiple concepts um, and, and operations. So moving, uh, moving forward, uh, we also wanted to understand how post-crisis reforms are, are captured in regulation. So what, what really happened there? Um, so we started with, with generating descriptive statistics, which, which were very informative and, and told us that the, the length itself of, of regulations increased, um, but also the, the actual network uh, increase, the size of the next network, the structure of the network change. So both when you look at nodes and edges of the, of the, of the rules, banking rules, um, they increased by over 60%. So based on that, we were able to say that the post-reform regulation is longer, contains more concepts and, and more operations. <clears throat> and, and this complexity can be very, uh, can, can be seen and I think it, it becomes more obvious when you actually create a network plot which uh, which nicely show the difference in in the structure of, of banking regulation before the crisis and after crisis so on the left hand side you can see this um, um, network plot with all rules coming from from one source from the rule book um, fairly concentrated and uh, when you when you go fast forward, 10 years to 2017, you can see that there are different sources. So four different sources, as I mentioned earlier, of, um, of regulation. And also you have suddenly a core, um, which is just much more central. And here this core, uh, COR, capital requirements regulation, uh, are the, the most important rules really, which are, which are, highly, which are very often cross-referenced. And, and that can tell you pretty much what the important rules are, or which ones are uh, the the ones that are that are highly referenced. So, so uh, using using this method, you can actually understand the entire system of, of the regulation. Um, so this, this is uh, this is applied here, obviously on the banking regulation, but the same the same method could be could be useful for for other um, legal research, actually. So uh, to summarize uh, our, our results here on textual complexity of post crisis reform, showed that there is a tighter core, which emerges in, in that network, that I just showed you on, on the previous plot. Um, and the, the legal style, in a way, changes, uh, limits, sorry, the complexity of language of, of individual rules. So rules are, are written in a fairly standard way. And we also found that at least a third of, of rules contain vague terms, terms like adequate, which require substantial interpretation. And the, the measures uh, that we use were validated using um, European Banking Authority Q and A's, and also a case study, which I'm not going to, to talk about here. Um, so, what uh, what's the usage of that? So, on top of understanding actually of um, of, of the, the regulation of the entire system using using this, these measures, you can also think about potential next steps, um, which uh, on which we are currently 
working with, with my co-authors, and, and that would be studying um, machine readable rules. So uh, among the regulators and, and supervisors, there, there is a growing interest in understanding which rules can be, uh, can be made machine readable. So traditional solution to, to regulatory complexity was simplification, but, but law is also interpretation. And, <clears throat> sorry, and supervision requires discretion. So we wanted to understand which rules potentially could be could be simplified, and also which rules require interpretation, um, because rules which which um, need contextual information, additional interpretation might be difficult for machines to understand. So in order to do that, we measured the the, the occurrence of vague and precise terms before and, and after the crisis. And here we show that um, vague terms are fairly common and uh, specific, but specific numerical va values so precise, um, precise terms are not. And uh, when it comes to vagueness, um, the distribution was fairly similar before and after crisis, whereas um, 2017 became uh, less, regulation became less precise uh, compared to the so that's the overall um, view of, of the regulation that I talked about previously. But uh, you can also use measures to, to identify individual rules. So you can find the rules which are uh, very vague, uh, for example, so that would be rules on the uh, in higher part of, of this chart here, um, and which rules are, um, uh, have high or low relative conditionality. So, so rules which are, which are in this um, red, uh, now, red dots are rules which require substantial interpretation and, and no conditional have no conditional operation. Um, so, so there are rules that that could be could be quite um, quite hard for, for machines, for example, to, to understand because they uh, they are they are vague at time at times. So um, they would not be that easy to um, to automate. And uh, rules in green here contain no vague terms but require a relatively high number of, of conditional operations. So that would be rules that would be easier for, for machines to, um, to process, for example. So using this approach, you can actually, you can identify certain, certain rules, certain regulations, which would be easier for, uh, for, for machines to understand uh, versus uh, uh, human, really. So you can see where, uh, where you have the, the benefits of all machine readable rules. So, um, to conclude, in, in, um, in this study, we use textual analysis to measure post-crisis increase in complexity. We found that uh, the, this um, regulation now is, is, is larger and, and uh, rules are more interconnected, but language of individual rules did not become more complex. And uh, we also introduced here approach to identify um, where machine readable rules uh, could succeed, which rules potentially could be machine readable, and we created new data set. So if you're interested in, in, in this approach, in, in this particular study, um, we published a working paper, which is, which is publicly available. And I'm, I'm showing the reference here. So um, please go ahead and read it. Or, or if you have further questions, either ask them on, on Slack, or just send me an email or, or find me on, on Twitter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Eric. That was our last presentation on this text text mining session. Uh, once again, you can ask all the questions on our Slack, and see you soon on another session. Statistics will start in ten minutes. Thank you very much.